say a big welcome to um, anyone who has dialed in for the webinar. Thank you for your interest. Um, just to ask everybody, can you please mute your microphones um, because that hopefully will help them to improve the sound quality as well. Um, obviously, it will be into the question and answer session if you want to speak and, and uh, if you have a question, then turn it back on, obviously. Um, so, um, and just a reminder as well that the webinar is going to be recorded and it's going to be then um, saved on the Inspired Life site. So it would be great to have this as a resource in the future. Um, but just for the moment, um, just so that everybody we need to make sure everybody's aware that that's going to happen. So if you would prefer not to have your voice feature, you don't ask a question. Um, but hopefully that's not an issue for anyone. So for those of you who have been attending the, the series of the Inspires webinars, the ones that were held before today were all organized by Inspires. Um, and the Inspires project, for anyone who's not familiar with it, has as its main goal to build effective cooperation between science and society by supporting the growth um, of science jobs and by facilitating the expansion of responsible participatory research and innovation in Europe and abroad. And today's webinar is a new variation in the series in that uh, it is organised in collaboration with the Living Knowledge Network. Um, and then after today, we'll have both Inspires and the Living Knowledge Network who will continue to collaborate and bring you further webinars. So just to introduce myself, I'm the coordinator of uh, the TU Dublin Programme for Students Learning with Communities. Um, and just to explain the background of this webinar before I introduce our other presenters, at the Living Knowledge Conference in Budapest, um, we had a, a number of different colleagues who organised science shops or support structures for community-engaged research. We realised that we all had anniversaries coming up. So for example, uh, our programme in TU Dublin is 10 years old and Queen's University Belfast have a 30 year anniversary of their science shop this year. And we decided that we would like to do something collaboratively to celebrate those anniversaries and to share our learning. So um, the other partners in the group are the University of Brussels, VUB, Corvinus University Belfast and the University of Guelph in Canada. And we came up with the idea of running um, webinars with case studies with a disciplinary focus. So new people were very interested in not just how do you do community engaged research within the curriculum, but specifically how do you do it in particular disciplines. And so we thought that we um, would, would take this approach and we decided to contact the Inspires team um, because they had already been running webinars on community engaged research and we thought would they like to collaborate with us on these webinars and we were delighted that they said they would. Um, and we're really pleased that these webinars are going to be recorded as resources for science shops to use the model um, and uh, with and for the Living Knowledge Network. And this is the first of these webinars and there will be more to follow as well. So just to introduce our speakers then, so with me uh, in the room from the Technological University in Dublin is David O'Connor, who's Assistant Head of School in Environment and Traffic. And he's also co-chair of the new multidisciplinary MSc in Transport and Mobility. And then uh, in uh, Belfast, we have um, three people from Queen's University of Belfast. We have Emma McKenna, who is the coordinator of the science shop. We have Neil Galway, who's lecturer and director of postgraduate studies in planning in the School of the Natural and Built Environment. And he coordinates the MSc Planning and Development and the MSc City Planning and Design programs. And we also have Helen McGuinness, who is a recent graduate from the MSc in Planning and Development. So the TU Dublin case study is going to be the first we're going to present. Um, so just to explain, we're going to go through the two um, case studies first, and then at the end we're going to have lots of time hopefully for questions and answers. So uh, I'm going to hand over now to David O'Connor, who's going to present the TU Dublin case study. Uh, thanks, Catherine. Um, I'll start on our case study. It's case study one. From ourselves to Dublin uh, and specifically uh, I guess I'm involved in two Dublin environment of planning uh, and we're very pleased to be part of this celebration of civic engagement uh, uh, activity uh, and it's something that's very essential to our own teaching and, and pedagogy it's uh, I suppose for many reasons we're um, a department of environmental planning so we're trained in environmental managers and planners of the future and we want them to, to be very well versed in uh, I suppose all issues of, of collaboration engagement, but also issues of, of community empowerment uh, and engaging with and uh, developing skills around bringing communities uh, into, uh, uh, into the planning system and empowering them in terms of um, enabling them to become active in their own community and societal uh, and regional development. Uh, so we do civic engagement activity across our modules, across years, across 
several different programs. Um, but I've chosen to talk about one particular project, uh, which is the Sanctuary River Greenway. Uh, and I think the reason that we chose this one is uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, firstly, it's uh, I could describe it as a longitudinal project. We've been working on this in collaboration with uh, Northside Partnership for several years. We've involved um, several student groups. And it's also quite a good example of community empowerment collaboration. So knowledge has been generated uh, with and from the community uh, very much to inform this. In fact, the impetus behind it really came from uh, the community partner and, and the community that they serve. So the community partner is, is an outside partnership, uh, and um, they're a, a, a partnership company um, established uh, and directed and funded by the Department of Communities, uh, and they're area-based, so an outside partnership work City and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And they're tasked with addressing issues of marginalization, uh, long term unemployment, uh, and uh, really working with communities towards social integration. That's their mission. Uh, and we connect with them. Uh, and we did a lot of work with them. I'll talk about the Healthy Communities Pilot, which was their initiative. Uh, but I'll talk first about the Central River Greenway, which is a project that we're involved in. So the Sanctuary River is um, it's a river, uh, it's a small, small enough water course in the northeast inner city. And it is designated as a strategic green region in one plan that the National Transport Authority have a, a site of that plan uh, with a strategic green network. Uh, I'll just sort of hover over that there and I'll highlight the Sanctuary River. So this is Dublin here, Dublin Bay, hopes to the north of the south, the River Liffey, the airports to the north, to the south. Uh, and you can see a lot of these are green my roots. The Sanctuary River sort of is a sort of orbital connection, and it's quite strategic to our community park for a number of reasons. Uh, and we've been working to have this this route in the city developed as a community and social. Um, so just maybe to, to start with some some results and, and you know uh, some success of the project. We've got this into the Dublin City Council Development Plan as a strategic objective. Uh, um, it's been funded under the Department of Housing Planning and Local Government on their Urban Regeneration Development Fund. So they've got, if you like, seed funding to follow up on some of the feasibility work that we're doing. Uh, and, and also, together with the, the partnership, Northside Partnership, uh, they won the DOT Presidents Community Partnership, which was really in recognition of. The very proactive and central uh, and engaged role uh, that they played, um, which was a huge assistance to us in, in terms of um, uh, of providing a, a real sort of teaching resource for, for our own students. So they came to us because they had this initiative called the, uh, the Healthy Communities Pilot, uh, and they were literally taking the most disadvantaged part of their area, uh, six electoral districts. I'll describe them to you in a minute. And they realized that to bring all of their issues and to bring all of their work together, um, it was really about health in the community. Uh, and that was a key issue. And they said, you know, um, what can we do uh, in terms of we're a department of environment planning, we have students um, uh, in these areas. So we got engaged in this healthy communities initiative. Uh, and through that, we identified that the Central River Greenway itself was strategic. And I'll just give you an example. We started looking at transport and mobility, uh, how people live in this area connected. Uh, and, you know, we looked at, you know, this existing research. So the communities are, are to the northeast of the city, and where these people want to travel to work is very much sort of orbitally around the edge of the city. And the public transport, and even the road connections and the roads and the cycling connections are very, very poor. Contrasted with sort of more affluent inner city areas, and they want to work in the city centre and the public transport uh, is very, very, very strong and very, very well served. So it's a real sort of indicator of, of disadvantage. Uh, and just to kind of, I suppose, to deepen that, uh, and, and the project that Northside Partnership worked on, which is the Health Communities Pilot, they, they took this area, which I'm just highlighting here on red, this is really six electoral districts, and these are, these have the highest deprivation score outside of you know, city communities um, uh, in the state. Uh, so you have very high social housing, uh, low income groups, a lot of dependency, um, 
uh, poorer than normal health. Uh, and also, uh, and we followed on with our own uh, research, we found that there was a very high demand for travel in this area, but very poor take up of public transport and even poorer take ups of, of active travel. Uh, and there were, you know, there were significant barriers to, to people walking and, and feeling safe in their neighborhood and, you know, social stigmas around and society and doing things that were very, very healthy. So the Sanctuary River sort of came up uh, because it, it really transected this entire area. So I'll just take you on a very quick tour uh, and then I'll, I'll probably hand you back to Catherine uh, of the Sanctuary River. A lot of it is already there uh, in, so far as there is a corridor and alignment and some there is. This is quite a, a nicely landscaped, a sort of semi-natural landscape uh, that's maintained by the thing called the Eddy Council. It crosses boundaries, it crosses administrative boundaries, that's a problem. And it's overlooked by some, you know, relatively good new apartment developments. But you don't have to go too far to find that, you know, there's a lot of the route that is simply, you know, unfit for, for, for people to use as a nation. That's, that's actually really signed in a journalist from the Dublin Empire, and we're taking him on a tour. Uh, and he wrote a really, really lovely article. And we've had a few really useful and interesting media pieces, which is part of our strategy to, to raise awareness for that. Uh, again, just thinking out some of the problems along the route, you know, there's, you know, antisocial behaviour, and, you know, environments like this actually attract it. Uh, and we've got really good examples of places like this have just been completely redesigned. So this type of very antisocial, very threatening, uh, that, that really takes away from people's feeling of safety, that it can actually be designed out very, very well. Just forward. Let's just go home for a little second. Okay, again. Okay, so change forward. Ah, okay, yeah. And, and again, you know, this is the, the, the northeast uh, of Dublin. This is, it's probably sort of a, a bit of a, a soccer, a football heartland. Uh, and yet some of the amenities just aren't great. Uh, you know, as part of our research, we visited a similar amenity in Belfast, uh, the Commons War the Greenway. Uh, and they used funding to, to really develop social amenities around the Greenway. Uh, there's huge opportunities for that. Uh, now, I'm asking for pictures. These are two suburbs, even more in Harmstown. So a lot of these suburbs are really, communities are, are segregated, are separate from each other by a lot of road corridors. But in this case, the open space, which is featureless, uh, which doesn't really provide any immunity itself is almost a barrier uh, to connections between communities. So we think that we can, um, uh, you know, this can be addressed through better landscaping and provide some of the community. So really to, to wrap up in our case study, um, you know, we've been engaging with communities uh, and bringing student groups up there uh, for quite some time in this now. Uh, and what we really think is important is to bring what we call a multifaceted approach um, to include participation, collaboration, uh, and also empowerment with local communities. That's really what we're trying to do with, with, uh, with our student groups. Uh, and the real challenge, uh, as I say, here is to make the Central River Greenway deliverable and successful as a community immunity, uh, accessible to everyone and enriching the lives of all those who are able to reach them. I feel like it's our mission and what we've achieved here. Uh, just as a, as a very tangible example of that, uh, one of our uh, student groups just looked at the number of schools uh, within a kilometre of the Central River uh, About 30 schools, all within walking distance of this community. Uh, and if it was put in place, they have a direct walk in and start it in relation to a UNESCO designated biosphere, uh, which is quite a beautiful resource, which they don't really have a connection with. So it's potentially quite powerful. Um, um, so it's been a good project, we'll continue working on it. Uh, with North South partnership with TOW access and civic engagement and all of those two groups. Uh, hopefully, it will continue to be a success. And, uh, so, uh, that's very much it. Thanks, Thanks very much. And can I ask maybe just because we've got maybe a minute left before we hand over to Queen's, could you maybe just flesh out a little bit what you got the students to do with the partners? So, what were specific maybe the students worked on? Obviously, part of the bigger okay. piece. But. Yeah. One of our initial engagements was Northside Park has been very good in sort of bringing the students up there, showing them the area, uh, you know, really explaining the context of the area. And um, that itself is very profound. So we set up um, actual interview groups with um, really people involved in community development, local people involved in uh, age friendly initiatives, employment activation, uh, parenting groups. Uh, and we actually had one-on-one -on -one interviews between students in these groups. 
Uh, and we, you know, one of the, the first exercises was to set up a travel diary project. So we were asking people what their actual travel packages were in the area. Uh, and that was very unique because it generated really powerful data that didn't really exist anywhere else. And we were able to benchmark the community against the citywide uh, no travel profiles and the national no travel profiles. And what we found was that people actually made many more trips, but the barriers to access were, were huge. But people a lot of time were, you know, in many cases afraid to go out, uh, afraid to use public transport, and very much dependent on sort of family in favour for basic levels of mobility. So that was just one example. Thanks, I know there's loads more, and I'm sure when we come to the question session, people might want to ask more detail about this as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so what we might do now is hand over uh, to our colleagues in Queens as they were, we're going to just hold off on the questions until we finish because somebody might have a question, you know, that, that maybe our colleagues in Queens will answer themselves when they talk about therapy. So that's why we're keeping all the questions to the end. Um, so yeah, so uh, I'm going to hand over to. Um, uh, and I'm going to pick up the, the mantle on the queen side. Um, and I'm just in case anyone can see the mantle, I'm going to hop over to the queen side there. Uh, can you see us and hear us okay? We can hear, we can hear you on top of them. Uh, we cannot see you at the moment. Actually, yeah, sorry, Irene, this is the bit where I meant to ask you to, uh, can you please take the queen's people, the presenters back? Can you make another presenter? Thanks. Yes, yeah, see, 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 has their own. Perfect, thanks. Catherine, we might stick with the slides with you if that's okay. Could we keep the slides just with Dublin? Okay. I think if you continue to be presenter, that might be better and we can just speak. Okay, well, we'll turn off the microphone there, and you tell us what to move the slides, yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm Emma McKenna, and I'm here with my colleague, Neil Galway, and with Helen McGuinness, who's also a student who did a science shop project recently. Um, just to say, in Queen's, we, as a science shop, work with um, academics right across the university. Um, but we have a particularly good relationship with academics and planning, and partly because it's a discipline that is so open um, to the outside world. And we've chosen this as a case study example because, in fact, Helen's project was judged to be the best done in the Queen's University Science Shop this year by an independent panel. So it seemed like a nice connection through. So I'm going to hand over to Neil first and then to Helen. Hello. Um, thanks um, for handing over to us, um, Dublin. We, I can't see the slides at the moment, but I'll, I'll talk around um, the first information. As Catherine already mentioned, I coordinate the master's programs in planning. And similarly to what David was saying, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, planning as a discipline involves active engagement with communities. It's not just about places, it's about people. It's about getting the students outside of the classroom. Over the last year, we've worked with communities um, throughout Northern Ireland and Ireland generous, generally. We've worked on harbour regeneration projects in the fishing village of Ard Glass in County Town. At the moment, we're working with communities in Hilltown, a small village in the Mourns, where they're looking for viable uses for a historic church that's been vacant for 30 years. So it's these types of projects, trying to get students to understand what communities need what are the challenges of places that is a large part of our own personal program? And both master's classes, our programs offer an opportunity for students to do work-based studies. It's worth a third of their degree. It's taught over one year. The final semester involves either writing a, ah, good. I can see the slides now. Can and you go to the next slide, Catherine? Could you move to the next slide, Catherine? Do you think they can hear? Me? Can you can you go on to the next slide, please? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that, that uh, next next one, please. 
you see the slides, yeah? I can yeah. see, yeah, yeah. Perfect. So I'll, I'll talk about this one. Perfect. And one of the things that we've, re we're, uh, we've been really trying to promote, we're, um, back, back to the previous slide again, um, is work with these at mass level. No. no. And um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just talk generally. This year, you know, even as part of programs, the students have been working with councils, they've been working with government agencies, they've been working on real world issues. Whenever I was listening to the very interesting case study from Dublin, real parallels with the types of projects that students have been doing in Belfast only three or four weeks ago drew up. You know, they've been looking at a Greenway project. Similarly, one that runs through areas of North and West Belfast, where there are issues of multiple deprivation, poor quality environments, and a chance to engage with government departments, but also with agencies as well. I think um, working with the science shop has always offered great opportunities for our students as part of the work-based studies. In recent years, they've completed excellent studies with guide dogs, looking at how High Street in Belfast could be less hostile to visually impaired users. They've looked at how community facilities in Annadale, a uh, loyalist community, could be made viable longer term. They've looked at projects um, in the Holy Lands, an area notorious for studentification, how it could be reimagined. But one of the most imp impressive projects is Helen McGuinness's. Helen's here to join us and talk about her presentation. Hopefully the slides can start to move on because I'm still looking at the wrong Hello. one. Yeah, we're still looking at the case study page, Catherine. I don't know if you might be able to go on to planning for dementia. Planning for dementia. Okay. Sorry about this. Okay, we can see it moving on. Yeah, okay. Maybe others can see that. Go on ahead, yeah. Helen. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, the first one is just an overview of really like the motivation behind um, planning for dementia. So it was like my fits in to plan it. It was just looking for alternatives. Oh, it's disappeared again. Um, yeah. um, so it's obviously a very prevalent and relevant concern in today's society. So um, the sand shop kind of motivated me to look at it in a case study setting. So um, I'll do the next slide. So I undertook my case study with the Springfield Charitable Association. So um, I was introduced through the science shop. Um, basically the motivation is um, the directors and the coordinators of the Springfield Char Charitable Association were looking at redeveloping a uh, new facility for an aging population in the West Belfast area. And my case study was looking at um, all of these individual institutions and how the urban frame um, links in between them. Um, to produce a more like independent uh, lifestyle for somebody with dementia or cognitive impairments. Um, so working with this charity um, was very useful because it was working towards a really practical goal. Um, I'll just, I think just moving on to the next slide. So the next slide is just a map of the, the study area that I took an example from and the pinpoints that are on it are showing where the um, facilities are in relation to the rest of the urban framework on the outside. Um, I've also labelled some um, specific features that I picked up through the street audit in the case study. So in the bottom right hand corner you'd see um, the Dunville Park fountain which would be a really distinctive feature and it's an example of good practice um, for somebody with dementia. It's a very, it's really um, helpful for somebody with dementia in their wayfinding abilities. Um, Something very specific to Belfast would be uh, the top left hand corner is the peace walls. Um, it's debatable whether these are familiar features or barriers in Belfast. So I think it's more, um, it's very unique to this sort of case study area. And I think more uh, research needs to be pushed in that direction. Um, just the results, case, um, the last slide. Um, just after the street audits, you're able to pick, I was able to pick up. Uh, on good practice solutions and um, make recommendations and help with the redevelopment of the Cooper Street project and how they fit 
in the rest of the urban framework in Belfast. Um, it was a really good opportunity to network in liaise with um, an organisation outside of academia and um, build connections in a very uh, practical sense. Um, it really helped me gain more awareness in my local community and what I could do in planning in that sort of direction. Um, that's basically, it was just very useful. Thank you. Helen. Thanks. So I guess um, I, I don't think we have anything more to say, so we could move to questions. And I think you were going to introduce that. Yes, Josephine's asking if she's the only one who can't see the slides. I think we've just had a bit of a technical hiccup, yeah. Josephine. So um, we can figure that we can figure that out next time. <laughs> this is just yeah. trial. Yes, I don't know why we're having that particular problem, but uh, we can see them perfectly here, but obviously you can't see them there. So I'm sorry. Um, what we can maybe do is send them on to, well, well uh, Irene actually, um, yeah, we can send them on maybe to you, and then if you want to maybe add them to it, but, but it's, you know, when you're putting it on the website, you can maybe attach it to the file or something so people can see all the slides. Um, so, um, yeah, so I guess. Um, and thank you very much for that, that case study. And it's great to have different perspectives, you know, to have a, a student speaking and, and a lecturer, and then Emma in your role as coordinating the project as well. Um, so I just need to see now has anybody got any questions? And I'm going to maybe ask Irena for a reminder as to how I can see the text. Sorry. <laughs> I, we should maybe say, Catherine, that if you have a question, please type it into the text. Um, I, we can see the text. You can bring it up at the right hand side, just on where you can see the number of participants. Oh, thank you. That's great. That's what I was looking for. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, sorry, Josephine. That's okay. So, um, yeah, so if anybody has a question and you want to type it in, uh, we'll come to you and maybe ask you to, to read it out. Um, I guess something that, that sort of was on my mind thinking about this and, and the different questions is, you know, you do a project and then the project finishes. And I suppose what I'd be interested in asking potentially everybody is, um, is there something that you would do differently if you were to do it all again? So if you had the opportunity to start from scratch, uh, is there something that you did that you think this could have been improved in this particular way? So I don't know whether we start with you, seeing as you've just been talking in Belfast, anybody there want to take that and then we maybe come to you as well? Yeah, I talk generally for a while. I think whenever you're looking at academic projects, you're sort of set parameters, be it hand in dates. And I think one of the good things about the project we heard about in Dublin was the sustained nature of the engagement with the wider community group. The fact that it influenced, you know, a wider group rather than just the community group, you know, the, the impact it had on policy. So sometimes it's maybe the sustained nature of engagement, retaining relationships that you build. Sometimes for my project and the one that are my projects, if you're talking about workplace studies rather than projects that fall within modules, would be that this is something that's done by and large over a longish summer from May till mid-September. And trying to ensure that the university is still able to offer some form of support after the students submitted their assignment or that they're able to continue working with the organization as well. I, th I think that's one of the most important things. And sometimes, you know, dependent on the nature of a work-based study, dependent on how much the student is able to deliver over the summer, you know, sometimes that can be stronger, I think would be, you know, just a general point, you know, on um, work-based studies, working with communities. Do you have any particular points of your own project? Um, I just find it very useful working on a very practical goal and um, you're being introduced to a lot of um, outside organisations or networks, particularly the Springfield Charitable Association um, with the redevelopment project that they were working on, you know, seeing that in practice after really kind of moving to you, you've done something worthwhile with your, your thesis and my master's. Emma, I don't know if you have any, any reflections on I think the, the for me the biggest challenge is that with any piece of research there's always a huge amount of research still to be done um, which is both the, the amazing thing and the difficult thing in, in my role because um, every student that you work with 
actually they need five other projects that other students can take on. Mm. And I suppose this is why we're so keen to try to expand the resource in terms of what we do, because we see the need in communities and we see that students benefit as well. Yeah. Um, so it's just about really trying to build the capacity to do the connecting part, both for us in Science Shop, but also supporting academics so that they feel, you know, some academics are very confident and comfortable you know, just sort of automatically and others maybe need just a bit of support to get to that point. Um, so I suppose that's for me, that's always the bit I feel I want to to kind of do a bit more of is the, the support bit that makes people feel comfortable to supervise something like this. Thank you. I can see Irena is moving us to my try and actually just turn down the speaker a bit so that might reduce the echo. Sorry about that. Hopefully we'll still hear you. Um, so, and then Nick, I suppose if you had something to do differently, if you had a chance to do that project again, is there anything that you think actually, you know? Um, you yeah, know, I'd echo what was um, said there actually. The fact that that project, we managed to keep it going for a number of years. So it went over a couple of semesters, was really, really beneficial because actually the people involved then got to see some change, got to see some impact, so it was really nice. So I, and, but that was really down to just key individuals on our side and on the community partner side. Uh, so that relationship was very good. In fact, one of those individuals in the Northside partnership now works for us. So uh, so it's that's just been a really healthy, really good relationship. And to try and get that into other projects um, and to give those academic supports um, at the end of each semester, everyone's under pressure to move on and set up new projects, uh, so to have the time and the ability to, to maybe do something with the data that you generate uh, will, be, will be really beneficial. I think you really start to see some, some impact there. Yeah, exactly. And it's interesting because it's the same point as saying about sustainability and the long term relationship, which generates those really useful kind of the impacts are, are much better in a way for both us in the university yourselves, the university in, in Belfast, and, but also for the community partners. Because Kind of consistency in that as well. And I suppose also thinking about like if, if there's anybody you know kind of listening or, or, or watching who um, who's thinking, okay, but how do I do this from scratch? So I mean and, and maybe you can start with you David and then maybe you can come to you in, in Belfast. So like when you started with these modules there wasn't any kind of element of community engagement written in. So you kind of had to look to build it and I know you've now come to a point where you've got this new program where you have written it in. So could you maybe talk a little bit about that process of Building yeah. the process of engagement into modules, and then we come to you as well in terms of that last Yeah, and I, I guess from from our point of view, our priority is to provide a, a rich learning experience for our students. So to actually, but when you take them out into a community or you know a community environment, that can be really really powerful. So it's worth taking the time to do that and building that relationship with the community partner and involving them in the. Um, the design of your project brief. Uh, so I think it's, um, uh, and again, thinking about the pressure that academics are under, uh, you know, it can happen relatively, you know, if you do go out and have a site briefing with the students and, you know, maybe there's an opportunity for a discussion or a conversation as to see what are your problems and how can we help. Um, and I think, well, I think providing a space to listen to the community partner uh, to really observe and be aware of what the problems are is it's quite important and uh, what it's worth doing. And did you find you had any particular issues when you were looking at your module structures or was it something that, because it's sort of spatial planning seems to me to be a kind of discipline where it's kind of obvious that you should be talking to people, but then that doesn't always translate into how your modules are written. Uh, no, and you know, in, in the real world, again, people in planning organisations can be under pressure and they can be put into, you know, tasks. Uh, but I think the real richness is when you do get that opportunity. And, you know, planners love this when they get to go out and work together with communities. And I think it's a good experience for our students to uh, be able to sort of work with communities and understand that's a beneficial thing because there's an awful lot of conflict in here in terms of planning work uh, and where, where that doesn't happen. Great, thanks. And how about yourselves then in, in Belfast? I think it really depends on the module, but also as um, David and Emma have already mentioned, the staff as well sometimes 
you know, sometimes people have contacts that turn into projects that can be made to fit into modules. You know, with the churn of staff, sometimes things change very quickly over a year or two. I'm thinking about a project that we're running at the moment. The module, it's part of planning and development. It's very different to whenever Helen did the course two years ago. Whenever Helen did the course two years ago, the students wrote two essays. This year, they're doing community consultations with 15 to 17 year olds from youth clubs on either sides of peace walls. You know, the module is about community planning. It's about talking to people. It's about thinking about regeneration ideas. Um, within the same broad learning outcomes that we have for the module, you're able to move a module from something that was quite dry, quite academic, quite theoretical, into something that is actually very challenging and very much a piece of engaged research. We had three sessions. We brought the 15 to 17 year olds um, through their youth clubs. And this was organized by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive. We brought them to Queens. We talked to them about you know, what university is about, about regeneration ideas for socially deprived neighborhoods generally, looking at global best practice in terms of urban design. We went out, we met them um, one evening got a tour around their wider areas, looked at what are the environmental challenges there. And then they, we had a consultation. Each of the five groups had to design their own consultation method from attempts at mental mapping to a very low level attempt at participatory budgeting. You know, if you have this, this and this, you can't have that. You know, just to try and get what people that are often well considered the troublemakers the difficult group within society, what they think about their neighborhoods. They're not valued overly. So we managed to change that module at the moment. Their final presentations will be tomorrow at nine. So we'll see how they've been able to interpret the information from the young people because they're giving very honest assessments. We're communities that we're a community that is um, in many ways isolated in the Belfast Hills. We've got to walk 10 minutes to get to our nearest supermarket. It's a very steep hill to go back up at. The closest shop is an abandoned van in the housing estate. Yes. These are the real world problems of this community. If you look at the other side of the river valley, less than 50 meters away, with no walking access, with no roads access, there are facilities. So it's these types of really wicked, difficult planning problems that we're able to feed into the syllabus. Whenever I inherited modules on plan making and urban design a couple of years ago. They were more academic exercises, but just through contacts. Um, my own background is as a practicing planner for 12 years. We did a part-time PhD. So you're able to draw upon contacts to actually make the project as realistic as possible, be it with community sector clients or public sector. We've recently done some interesting projects in places like Kilkenny, Donegal, Rush, you know, just getting the students out, getting them talking to people and trying to understand. Some of it might be my own inclination not to give two hour lectures and a keenness to engage with real world issues. But generally across master's programs and planning disciplines, there is this opportunity. You know, sometimes it does vary between the staff as well. I've talked for a little bit too long. I'll hand over <laughs> to either Emma or Helen who may wish to disagree with what I've said. Thank you. Well, I, I thank you. I was just going to say, um, it's interesting that that idea of you know, you're talking to 17 year olds and you're hearing what they have to say, and there may be 17 year olds whose voices aren't heard very often. And so that idea of kind of empowerment resonates also with what you were talking about there in relation to your projects. Um, and so I think that the critical thing is that this is the mutual benefit, you know, is that not only hopefully are we helping groups from society who maybe don't have much of a voice to actually exercise that voice, but also then it's the opportunity for students to then. Uh, Meet and talk to those people, um, and and um, and and the learning that's possible for them to do. Um, and so, um, and just before I get to you, Helen, um, just to remind you, if you have a question, do do pop them in uh, into the text box there as well, because uh, we can just be talking, but we, but we can take take questions if, if you have them. Um, so yeah, Helen, I suppose that experience then for you, or maybe talk to people you might not otherwise have spoken to, um, and hearing about their experience in the city. I mean, can you maybe explain, you know, in what way that was useful to you? Sorry, can you repeat that question, please? Uh, apologies, maybe I didn't make it. Helen was one of the students that did the exercise that involved writing two essays two years ago. She she isn't a current student. She graduated two years ago, and 
maybe doesn't remember her essays for uh, Ruth no. McAreefy. I can't remember her, Jenny Crawford. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, I guess on your current, on the project that you just won the, the award for, you were very much engaging with communities. So, you know, what, what is the the benefit to you as a student of you know um, of actually talking to people you might not otherwise get to talk to whose voices might not be heard that often. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting to kind of see like a local perspective and how I, like well like my background in planning can fit into that. So when I was introduced to Terry McNeil, who's the coordinator of the Springfield Charitable Association, which I based my case study around, um, he was saying that they were redeveloping this Cooper Street project, but looking to expand that and look at the other urban areas outside of that instead of these isolated institutional care facilities. So it was like really practical to see the plan and can fit into that sort of community initiative. Great, thank you very much. And I see Josephine has a question. So Josephine, do you want to speak your own question? No, yeah, it's just, I was wondering how the assessment is taking place and how uh, community partners are involved in that. Okay, um, do you want to start with? Yeah, well, it's a really good question. Um, well, uh, firstly, importantly, to involve, again, uh, I'm actually involving the community partner in, in project design and design a brief uh, because inherently the problems there. So, the really important thing to do is to involve them in the assessment. Uh, so, um, for most of the projects, uh, our project stages, we usually have um, an interim creation and a final creation. Uh, sometimes that took place on site. Community parts organization, or sometimes it's here. But we always involve the community partner either on the panel or in the assessment. Uh, we did something else as well. There was one opportunity, uh, and there was uh, a research project that has its so engagement. We're involved in the response to research and innovation. So they came along and assessed what we were doing as well. And that was very useful as well uh, as an exercise in civic engagement to make sure that we were then responsible for what we're doing. There's quite a lot of ethical issues in terms of engaging with communities and um, also bringing students uh, who bring their own backgrounds into community organisations uh, and making sure that that interface is a positive one. Yeah. And uh, you said that was the right person because Josephine was the person who coordinated the image project. Which that was yes. part of. So, uh, so, we, we, so we honestly, we didn't set that up. This was completely spontaneous. <laughs> so she's smiling. Um, and then how about yourself then in, in that aspect? In terms of work-based studies, and to whenever Helen completed it two years ago, it would have been assessed against standard dissertation criteria. Since then, we've had an opportunity, we've looked at it and went, this doesn't work as well as it could have, you know, because it's standardized literature review, methodology, discussion of results. It, it doesn't work as well. So we've changed um, the assessment to include what was part of a different master's program. Now they can all do work-based studies, but 20% of the mark is based on how you negotiate the brief with your client. So there is more of a focus. The outcome, the final publication is more like a consultancy style report. It's a more visual document, a lot more map-based, more problem-based, a bit less theoretical, less like a mini PhD. In terms of the, the brief is obviously very heavily influenced by the client. For science shop projects, it's great to work with the um, science shop because they're able to help manage expectations on all sides. So the community gets what a planning student should be doing. We've had difficulties in the past when uh, community organizations tried to get planning students to ring banks to get them <laughs> loans and strange things like that. But sometimes it's helping make them understand what are the learning requirements of this particular program and it's working with groups so they can understand what the issues are you're quite right about the ethical issues and the concerns whenever we did this project with the 15 to 17 year olds this is something that we were only doing because it was through the housing executive an agency that isn't going to go away you know um, an agency that is um, embedded you know that will potentially be able to fund some of the smaller projects that students can come up with through cohesion funds. So if they were able to come up with like a small temporary urbanism, light touch intervention, they say that this is something that they could fund, especially if the young people are buying into it. So it's it's being able to have that type of an anchor institution 
that will still be there that is keen to work with us again you know whenever it turns into a slightly more developed um, piece for funded proposal as well which isn't just for young people so I think it's important that we work well with the institutions that have the responsibility that relates to what the students are doing for me and can I just add to in terms of partners being involved in assessment that's something I think we struggle with because some partners are so grateful that anyone is doing anything yeah. that they'll mark things quite high others kind of say oh well you didn't get absolutely everything right and they mark low it's consistency, so isn't it's it? very difficult to control for that we always do evaluation with partners afterwards so that at least at a minimum we know what they thought of the mm -hmm. project and in fact that forms one of the planks to judge who the best student project who has done the best student project every year it's that what the community group has thought of it as the, the major mm. evaluation criteria but we don't tend to involve them in actual marking of courses for that that variability reason i'm gonna come back to you on that because you said that you do have the community partners there when the students are doing their presentations and Feedback. Do you get them to actually look at marking and scoring criteria, or is it more about the process of feedback to the students? Okay, now that's that's a really useful point. Um, I'll get, for example, in the in the case today that we presented, um, the partner organisation will themselves be very expert in, if you like, community development. Um, so mm -hmm. we want to show that had done doctoral studies on area-based community development, for example. So they would actually be quite sort of well trained uh, in academic settings. So that, but we do have examples where we brought in individuals from communities, but we'd be very careful about how we manage that and making sure that they understand what the assessment criteria are, uh, what the goals of the, the project and the program are. So I think that's quite an important point, and that's our responsibility to to manage that and make sure that um, I suppose that the students are are, are protected. Um, uh, in, in that regard as well, uh, and I yeah, and we normally have assessment panels. There would be, if you like, it there's usually a third party recipient agency, your local authority, might be a government agency, and you know it's quite a good panel if you have community, if you have maybe ourselves and we have an agency involved, and even business or investor involved as well. So trying to get a, a balance of assessment uh, is, is quite a good thing. Yeah, and also just to add from our perspective that sometimes we find community partners don't want to be involved in the assessment because they sort of feel they can play more of a mentor in those students if they don't, if the students don't think that they're going to be assessing them. So it, it really does very usually point to projects. And as you say, what's most important is they are going to be involved in this process that we say communication around it, um, so that everybody understands what the process is um, and that their views are taken into account. And then obviously, if they're not going to be involved, if there's at least that process of feedback, you know, which is so important for student learning. Um, it's that thing of, you know, you, talk to them, you do a project, and what, how, how useful is it to you? And I thought that point you made also about, you know, end products, and you know, that, you know, if they're more visual, they're more usable, they're more practically applicable kind of end products when you have this kind of community engagement it's often than if you don't, um, which I thought was another good point, you know, and, and, and the policy implications of the kind of mm -hmm. projects you're talking about there that you're talking about here and, and how to get them embedded into well, the policy is really exciting and it, it really is showing them the impact of these kind of projects and um, both for the wider society as well as for participants directly involved like yourselves and staff and students and then community partners as well. Just to say we had um, lined up um, a colleague who had uh, worked at uh, Ron side partnership uh, with David to come along to the, today but unfortunately uh, due to other circumstances he won't be able to make it. So we had hoped to have a community perspective as well but it just wasn't possible. Um, so um, we don't have any more questions and we're coming up to the hour. Um, so maybe just to, to finish up with some thank yous I suppose unless anybody has anything they, they are really burning uh, they were dying to say. No? Okay, and there's nothing else coming through on the text. So to say uh, thank you very much. And um, there is follow up actually the last slide. Maybe we won't try and show the last slide, but maybe when it's uh, when it's um, put on the web, uh, the slides can put beside. But we did list some resources on that from the Living Knowledge Network, from our own um, uh, students learning the communities in the TUW, and from the Science Shop in, in Queen's University Belfast, and obviously also on the Inspires website. Um, so there are resources there that are available and also if anybody has any further questions, if you want to contact the Inspires team um, and you can do that through the email uh, that you were sent the invitation to the uh, webinar today with the link uh, 
through that, um, because they're very happy to take part on. And um, so can I say a big thank you to um, all the speakers who put time into comparing PowerPoints, even though we weren't able to show all the slides, um, and to think through, uh, you know, what to say. I've had a couple of uh, planning meetings to do this, because obviously, as you know, collaborative working takes time, but um, it, it generates really, really better results than, than working on your own. Um, and to say a big thank you to Inspires as well um, and the Living Knowledge Network, obviously, uh, for the support for the webinar, and in particular to Irena in IS Global, um, who has been there for the whole session for technical support and has been muting us quietly in the background when the echo got to that, the speakers and so on, and you couldn't have got without her as well. Um, and thanks very much to everybody who tuned in, um, and thank you to people who, uh, who asked questions and, and made comments, and, and I saw somebody comment tomorrow, good luck with your 9 a.m. event, uh, being back to the community thank you. and back as well in Queens. Um, so yeah, so just to say thank you so much everybody, and uh, and hopefully there will be another one of these coming along in a, in a month or two, and, and we might see some of you then. So thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>